God is in the details, and Eric Chris uh, is a master of um, detail focus um, and has an interest in um, kit cars and, and custom cars you build at home, predating his interest in electric vehicles, actually, uh, and has done several. And uh, the Saab Sonnet, uh, I think you want to take a look at. It's uh, uh, kind of a marvel. And he's here today to uh, share some of that with us, probably under the auspices of Chris Motors more than anything else. Would you all please give a warm welcome to uh, Eric Chris? Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, I'm, I wanted to ask before I got started, how many of you have yet to build an EV? Okay, that's at least, at least half, I think. And, and uh, this is, what I'm gonna be talking about is really more aimed at you than the, the rest of you who have already uh, gone about it and built at least one EV, and some of you are very, very advanced. Um, I want to talk in a, in a much less te technical way, I'm not even going to hardly mention batteries, about some of the things you've got to grapple with as you really think about how do you actually build this car, uh, and particularly one, I say your dream EV, because how do you build a car that you really want to drive? Um, maybe five years ago or four years ago, the issue was, can you build an EV? And I think we're beyond that. Now it's, can you build the EV you really want to drive around, as opposed to uh, just put some batteries in a, in a motor? Do you hear me, by the way? This keeps going on and in and out. Okay, great. Um, a little bit about uh, some of the things I've done. I actually wanted to build an EV, and I got very serious about it in, a, in 2008, 2007, 2008. And the car I wanted to build was an electric Cobra. Um, and. Um, uh, I somehow convinced my wife that I had to build a gas-powered one first before I could build a, uh, an electric <laughs> one. And I, and I went ahead and did that. And as I began researching uh, back in those early days, uh, sort of like the dark ages, of how would you actually build an electric Cobra, I had never heard of uh, uh, iron phosphate batteries. I'd never heard of uh, AC motors. Uh, I didn't really, uh, you know, I, I really didn't know what a controller was. But I quickly kind of convinced myself that I'd never get the power that I needed out of a, for a Cobra out of the current technology because I was putting in an engine that was uh, about uh, almost 400 horsepower. And I just didn't, I looked around, I couldn't find an electric motor and batteries. All I knew about were lead-ass batteries that was going to do that. So um, one day searching the internet, I found this guy out in Missouri who was talking about uh, on a video uh, I think it was the, the very first video that he did, was talking about this beautiful speedster and how these batteries made it possible. And, um, and I was listening to this video, and I think I watched the video about eight times, and finally my wife came into my office and said, who is this guy? <laughs> and uh, what are you doing? And so that kind of led me to, to, uh, to copy Jack and, and, um, and do a, a Beck speedster. Uh, very much along the lines of uh, uh, speech, the second one that he did with the uh, AC50, um, using 36 um, uh, cells. I, I think I got the only shipment I've ever heard of of the 200 amp hour Thunder Skies. And I asked all kinds of other people, you know, who, who has those in their car? Anybody here has a 200 amp hour? You do. Okay, well, we must have been the only four shipments that, uh, that were there. That kind of, um, so that's in the car. And then I decided to do um, a convert a car, which was my 1969 Saab Sonnet, uh, using, again, the AC50 motor, um, this time with 100 calves. And, um, uh, and now I'm thinking seriously about doing the Factory 5, the same company that, uh, that builds the, uh, the Cobra kit. Uh, doing their new car called the 818, and that's based on Subaru running gear, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But what I, what I wanted to start out with was some extremely fundamental things that, that may seem uh, uh, redundant or, or obvious, uh, but it's kind of things that I wish somebody had mentioned to me maybe five years ago, because it probably would have saved me about three years. So uh, uh, I'm going to very quickly go through these, and some of the process that that I go through. I am a little obsessive. 
and maybe I do things in more detail than, uh, than is necessary, but, uh, but so be it. Um, just in terms of planning tools, you can do an awful lot with almost no money, seriously planning what you're going to build. And uh, I know this seems incredibly simplistic, but your best friend's a digital camera. You can't take too many pictures of your car. Uh, my wife looked at my, at my huge file of photographs and she said, where's the family? You know, because I think I've got about 6,000, you know, photographs of car, a par, parts and cars. And, you know, I have, you know, a couple of my, you know, the family. So, but you can take a lot of pictures. They really help. Um, straight rulers, very helpful. Get a few plastic ones because you do not want to use a metal ruler across the terminals of the battery. Uh, that's a good safety tip. And uh, a tape measure. I love this little digital laser measure. Uh, there's a bunch of them. Uh, it's the most expensive thing I've got up here. You can get it from uh, Home Depot. And it's a great way to measure things in the chassis, measure things in the car, where it's inconvenient to have a tape measure. You can't reach, maybe you want to go through a hole, you want to go through a narrow opening, it's very helpful. Um, a, uh, an angle finder, uh, very helpful. Digital caliper, essential. You're going to want to measure a lot of stuff. Uh, and, uh, and finally, you need a, a calculator. Uh, almost everybody's got an iPhone or something like that these days. This has got a camera and it's got a calculator and uh, actually it's even got um, you know, things for, for doing your uh, uh, alignment. So that's, uh, it doesn't really cost much to uh, once you have a phone to, uh, to do all this stuff. In terms of planning applications, but sort of doing documents and apps, uh, you're going to want to do a fair number of documents uh, just so, uh, if you're like me, I forget everything a day, a day later. So there's going to be some spreadsheets and Word documents, going to write things down, things about vendors. And um, I, I like, I'm an, I'm an open source guy. I like um, uh, LibreOffice, uh, Google Docs, things like that. Conceptual drawings, I think you're going to want to do a lot of drawings that are not really CAD drawings, but are specific enough that you can really kind of map out what you want to do in the, in the vehicle. Um, I like Diagram Studio. It's the best thing I've found for doing wiring diagrams and for doing just conceptual drawings. It's much easier than a CAD system. Uh, you can learn to, to use this in probably about 30 minutes or less. Um, and you can, there's a free download. Uh, you need to do some image editing, superimpose uh, things uh, to, in, to help in your planning. I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, Pixel, Pixlr, I don't even know how you pronounce it, .com is a free thing. And, uh, or you can go buy a copy of Photoshop, maybe you already have that. Um, and finally, um, if you get serious enough, you're going to want to do some CAD 2D drawings uh, if for no other reason than to make them machine shop ready so you can get some parts made and, not, and, and reduce the cost. Um, I do a fair amount of work with, with a, a machine shop that's near my garage, and there's a big difference between the guys who walk in with something on the back of a napkin, and believe me, people do, and, or walking in with pretty much finished drawings. And it's a lot, you, you basically are saving the expense of having the machinist try to figure out what the hell it is you want to build. Um, my favorite piece of software for doing 2D CAD is called DraftSight. Uh, it's made by a company, uh, a French company, great company, Dassault Systems. And uh, they're the people who, in their 3D modeling, it's a, it's a very popular piece of software called SolidWorks. For those, in, most of you are here are, are, are engineers, I think probably half of you are uh, mechanical engineers, and I'm sure you're very familiar with SolidWorks. Um, for those of you not intimately familiar with the world of uh, 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 digital machining, uh, I just want to spend uh, thir 30 seconds and just kind of giving you the lingo so that when you go to a machine shop uh, and they're throwing around some terms or something, you're not completely bewildered. But it starts out on the design side, which is the, um, uh, the blue circle. And, uh, and that's what we call CAD, computer-aided design. Most of you are quite familiar with that. And again, uh, you know, SolidWorks and DraftSight are the leading uh, uh, piece of software. And DraftSight's free. So you might as well learn it. It's the same kind of system, basically the same menu system, the same structure. 
as, uh, as solid work, so you'll be a, a real leg up. And when you have a spare hour in the evening, you can play around and learn how to draw stuff. That's only the beginning. Then it has to go over into a translation step, which is uh, generally called CAM, Computer Aided Manufacturing. And what that's really doing is figuring out how to take a two or even a 3D drawing and what the machine is really going to do. What is it cut first? What holes are drilled first? What edges are finished first? In what order? And where is that tool really kind of uh, moving around? And then finally it goes to what's called a post-processing, which is turning this into the G code, which is what a milling machine or a lathe actually uh, you know, understands and goes through the, the steps to perform what you're doing. So it's, I think, helpful to just know this so that when you're thinking about getting parts machined, uh, you can, you can uh, have a, a more intelligent conversation with the machinist. Where do, where do I start? Um, I'm a believer in starting with the platform. And in uh, automotive lingo, that means, uh, that means the vehicle. The vehicle without a motor or an engine, maybe without a, a transmission, but with a suspension system and with brakes and uh, with an interior and seats and windows and uh, stuff like that. That's the, that's the platform. Um, sometimes people say, uh, come up to me and say, well, I really love this motor and I, you know, I'm going to get this motor. And to me, that's like saying, I'm going to buy furniture before you buy the house. So I think you ought to start with the, the platform. In my particular case, um, and again, what you really want to build and, and kind of uh, your dream EV is going to completely uh, be all over the map from uh, you want a big truck to be able to haul something or, or whatever. I like to drive light, small, fast cars, and that's kind of what I'm into. So I was looking for a platform that was lightweight. Uh, by that, I mean under 2,000 pounds, um, a, pretty much as a two-seater. Um, and then I had these other kind of requirements. I like fiberglass bodies. Uh, they're a little easier to change a few things than, than sometimes metal is. Sufficient space for batteries. When you are talking about a kit, um, there's uh, a lot of kits that are uh, manufactured uh, are based on what's called a donor car. For those of you who don't, are not familiar with the kit industry, a donor car means a regular car that you then uh, buy and cannibalize, taking certain parts out of it, primarily the motor, the engine, and the transmission, and, um, uh, and then throwing away the rest of it or, or sending it to the junkyard. Uh, the advantage of that is that sometimes you can get a single car donor. Uh, for example, Factory 5 in the Cobra, the donor is a Mustang. So if you just get a Mustang, uh, you've got all the other parts to, uh, with a few little uh, things that they kind of leave out. But you pretty much got all the other parts to have a drivable car uh, by taking the kit plus the harvested parts from the donor. The disadvantage is that you're using parts that um, have a sometimes unknown uh, usage pattern. You might have a transmission with 140,000 miles on it. You might have an engine with a blown gasket. You might have all kinds of things that you don't really know until you get into it. So there's been, over the past maybe four or five years, the rise of the non-donor kit, which basically re relies on the aftermarket to, uh, to find parts that, uh, that are new. Sometimes they're from China or Mexico, and sometimes the quality is horrible. But if you're careful, you can actually build a car with completely all new parts and avoid the donor, which is the non-donor uh, method. And my Cobra, I decided to do that way. So I didn't have a Mustang. Um, I got the parts, uh, and they're all, they're all brand new. So I was particularly looking for a non-donor kit or a, uh, an existing vehicle in really good shape. Um, and finally, I was looking to spend under $25,000 on the platform. That may strike some of you as a lot, because I know there's a lot of people looking around for a $1,000 platform or, you know, rusted out 40-year-old VW Beetle with no rear windshield and no rear window, and, well, you can do that. But if you want to have a dream car that you really want to drive around, you'll spend uh, thousands, maybe even tens of, tens of thousands of dollars fixing up the car. That's a whole other project. And if you want to go into car restoration, that's great. But for this particular thing, I was looking to not do that. Oh, one other point. Uh, maybe I'm an obs obsessive planner, but I've found that in all the projects I've done, 
really literally about half the time I'm planning, about half the time I'm building and testing. So there's a really a lot of planning, unless you're simply doing and copying something that somebody else has done. I piggyback on Jack a lot for the Speedster, and I think the component I had in planning was way down because I think he put in 10,000 hours, but uh, unless you've got that advantage, you're going to do a lot of planning. After picking the platform, I think the most important thing to do to avoid being disappointed when you're done is to figure out what really is your technical objective. What are you trying to do with this car that constitutes the fact that it's your dream? And when I started out with the, um, with the Porsche, um, because I really like classic historical vehicles, I really wanted an electric car that was exactly like the gas-powered version. I wanted it to shift the same. I wanted it to feel the same. Um, I wanted it to be a little less noisy. That would be nice. But other than that, I wanted it to be exactly like a Porsche Speedster. I wanted to drive like a 1950 sports car with the crazy swing axle and everything else. And um, uh, watching what Jack had done convinced me that this was really possible, given the technology um, of approximately 2009-2010. Uh, and so, uh, and, and I'm very pleased with this car. I love this car because uh, it, it drives just like a Porsche, and that's what I wanted. For the 1969 Saab Sonnet, uh, which I have had for a long period of time and know intimately very well, I actually wanted it to have more power because it's a little bit underpowered, always was from day one. It's a, it's a crazy great little car to drive, great autocross car, but you know, it's got 60 horsepower, uh, 57 horsepower. To be honest, it's probably 52 horsepower. I don't know what it really is, but it's not very punchy. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to have an electric car that was, looked just like the original, handled at least as well, and had some punch to it. So I wanted to exceed uh, the original ICE requirements. And, um, and, and I've, I've done that, and it's great. I mean, this is, this is the best Sonnet to drive, I think, in the world, because it's electric. Uh, they should have made them that way originally if they could have, but you know, it's a, it's a great car. The thing I'm thinking about now is matching a current high-performance car, much tougher. You know, the envelope has moved a lot. We've moved the goalposts, so to speak. So I'm looking at the 2014 uh, Factory 5 818, um, and I'll talk about that. It is based on the running gear of a Subaru WRX, Subaru Impreza. For those of you who know the Subaru, I think the years are 2002 to 2007 is what uh, Factory 5 is, is looking to, uh, uh, to use. And they're basing this on a single car donor, as I described before. They want you to go find or, or, or own uh, already a 2002-2007 WRX or go to some junkyard and find one that's all smashed up so you can harvest the parts or buy one off of eBay or something like that. Um, so as I was planning this, and this is the bleeding edge, the question was, well, what kind of motor uh, battery combination can I get in there that's going to fit in the redesigned chassis and body, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, that's going to actually match the, uh, uh, or, or exceed the, uh, the high performance standards that, that, that we have today. And so I was looking at the dual AC35, so I also looked at the AC50, which I love in the other two cars, um, and, uh, and packing it with 46 or 48 CALB 100s. Um, now, I, I'm feeling comfortable about that because the 818 stands for 818 uh, kilograms which is uh, 1,800 pounds. And my sonnet with me in it is 1,800 pounds. And I have 100 calves in that. And, I'm, and I tend to drive a little fast. And uh, I, my range is about 55 miles in the, with, with, 100, uh, with the cow 100. If I was really driving carefully to, to, to maximize my range, I think my range is about 75 miles. Um, and I figured that, you know, 50 some odd miles in an 818 is fine for me, for what I'm, for I'm looking for. So I'm comfortable with the lower weight because I want to keep the weight down to the design weight of approximately uh, 1,800 pounds. 
Here's some planning you can do. That's the 818 up in the corner. That's what, it, that's what the front of the car looks like. And so this is just back of the envelope. You don't need to buy anything. You can do your research on the, on the web. Thanks to, uh, uh, to, to, to <laughs> what you guys have done with your website. It's now you can actually get this data a lot easier. Although I'm not sure this is the current data. So the, take this as directional and, uh, and not exact. But what I've done is simply taken performance figures off of a dyno for theoretically what the 818 would be like with the dual 35s running at about 1,000 amps um, and uh, versus uh, the, um, uh, the, the turbo WRX uh, in, the, in the Subaru. Now, the Subaru actually has two different engines. One is turbo, one is non-turbo, a, a 2.5 and a 2.0, and then a 2.5 turbo. And they have fairly different um, uh, horsepower and torque profiles. Uh, and I know what's going to happen to, you, you can build a, an 818 with, with a non-turbo. It's probably going to be a great car, uh, probably a really good car. But I was a little greedy, and I thought, well, how close can I actually get to a turbo uh, version? Um, and so this is the back of the envelope where you can see that up to about, what do I have there, about 2,500 RPM, the, the dual 35s trump everything in terms of torque. And, and I mean, it, it just, it, it's great. Now, that's only up to 2,500 RPM. After that, actually the turbo is a little bit better, but uh, the dual 35s are better than the non-turbo uh, ice in the, in the Subaru. So it's kind of an open question about whether does that 10 or 15 percent, uh, is, it, is that, is that going to really matter when you get out into the car in the real world? One thing I've learned kind of painfully is you can draw the charts you want and you get in the car and you know it's kind of different. There's so many parameters to think about. So this is just directional in terms of you know how is it going to be. But it, this gives me confidence that given the current technology we have today, I'll be able to get pretty close and maybe actually achieve parity performance with a high performance modern sports car. That's pretty awesome. And it's not going to cost $107,000. That's pretty awesome. OK, so how do you go about this once you've got your platform, once you pretty much have a general idea of what's going to go in there? What do you do? Well, the what I, first thing I do is, where is it going to fit? What do I put where? Um, and I just go through a pretty simple process of taking lots of pictures and, uh, and using those, uh, you know, image, uh, you know, editors to kind of put little pieces of stuff. And I do it from different angles, and I measure a lot of stuff. And at the end of the day, after doing this for, for several hours, I say, yeah, it's going to fit, or it's going to almost fit, I'm not quite sure, or it's not going to fit at all. And uh, you do that enough, and you solve the problem. So, at first, I thought I was going to put more batteries in the front. No, that's not going to work. I've got to put them in the back. OK, I thought I'd put them here in the back. No, that's not going to work. I'm going to have to put them over here, too. And you just kind of iter iteratively go through the problem until you solve it. Once you do that, then you can take that uh, conceptual drawing stuff, and you can start drawing out. Now, this is not CAD. You don't have to get real specific for a machinist. But you start drawing out, OK, what do these components really look like? How am I actually going to mount this motor? Uh, you know, where are the struts uh, that I need and where are they going to hit the chassis? And you just kind of work through this. If you stand back and you look at a car you want to convert or you want to build a kit and you say, you can get completely overwhelmed with the 10,000 decisions you have to make. But if you actually kind of do it just step by step and grind away at it, it's really, I find, you know, it solves itself really over time. It's, it's not that tough. That leads you to a couple of issues you're going to have to address right up front. One is, how do you mount uh, an electric motor to a transmission? Because almost certainly you're going to have to, to do that. Um, if you're fortunate enough to have made a decision to build a car that somebody has already mounted to the transmission you're going to use, for example, uh, there's some, uh, Jack's got some great mounts for, uh, for the AC50 or for you know, the, the Warp 9s. Uh, mounted to uh, you know VW and Porsche transmissions, then you don't have this problem. You know that's just a, pretty much a plug and play. In the case of the Sonnet, uh, in the case of the Subaru with a Subaru transmission, this is a problem, uh, a problem to be solved, a problem you can easily overcome. But it's it's an issue you've got to address. 
So I started out taking a lot of photographs. This is a superimposed photograph of the engine superimposed over the bell housing and then drawn in what I thought my, my, uh, my plate was going to be, my mounting plate, uh, between the motor and the transmission. And then thinking about how I, what kind of side mounts do I want to, for stability, what, else, what, a, what, what are my clearance issues, and you begin to iterate through how this is really going to work. And uh, do you have enough space? Do you have to change some of the, uh, um, hopefully you don't have to modify the chassis, but if you do, how do you modify it in the, in the least possible way? And then that turns into, uh, after you've got these, these photos and you think you know what you're doing, you start doing some conceptual drawing. Uh, uh, I was helped here because HPVS uh, has actually some very nice drawings of the motors. Uh, so it's pretty easy to, uh, you don't have to replicate all that, you copy it off their website. And, uh, and so here I'm superimposing my first cut at what my front motor mount is going to be. In the Sonnet, the Sonnet transmission is not anchored very well. It's got a rear single point mount and a very flimsy side mount. And actually it's, it's, it, it uh, is hopefully being supported by huge engine mounts, except that I decided to mount uh, something in the front of the motor to secure it, and but I had to figure out how that was going to work and how it was going to fit in. So this is just pre-planning. I haven't spent a penny going to uh, uh, a machine shop, but you can send out these little plans to your three or four or two favorite machinists and say, okay, what's this going to cost? And uh, when you get a ballpark uh, estimate, what I usually do is then go back and do a detailed drawing and say, okay, now what's it going to cost? And that way you can pretty triangulate pretty quickly on, uh, on what that's going to be. It also helps to identify issues right away. Um, I don't know, how many of you are f deeply familiar with the Subaru? That's what I thought. I, had, I didn't know anything about the Subaru. It was like, you know, I knew about Fords, uh, I knew about the Saab, I knew about British cars, the Porsche, uh, Chevys, uh, you know, a little bit about, uh, you know, Chrysler's. Subarus was like foreign territory for me, and I was totally shocked when I got into this to learn that the flywheel is not in the bell housing. The flywheel is in the motor casing. And uh, now, you could stand back and say, so what? But the so what is that somehow the flywheel has to be encased in your motor mount, and uh, which is a a somewhat, it's a non-trivial thing to have determined. Also, Factory 5 and the 818 decided to flip the transmission so that actually the front of the transmission was what the rear of the transmission was in the OEM version, which means that the shift for the car is, um, is at the rear of the car. All right, see if I can point that out. That's where the shifter is, which means you've got to have a cable it runs the whole way to the front of the car to be able to shift the car. And the reason I mention that is that anytime there's some oddball thing in a conversion, it really means it's a potential vulnerability because it means it's probably not going to work quite as well as something that was really designed to do that exactly. So in my Cobra, I've got a T5 transmission and the shifter sits right over the transmission, and it's one piece of metal, and you move it like this, and you move it like that, and it's fantastic. It's a great shift. And I kind of know right away that in the 818, running some crazy cable system all the way through the cockpit, all the way around the car, ending up at the end of the transmission here, I know it's not going to shift probably quite as well as the Cobra, and I'm hoping that I can minimize whatever the problem is. And hopefully, the fact that it's an EV doesn't make it worse. Uh, but it's just something to be aware of. And when you plan this way, you hopefully we'll get, you know, like 80% of the issues. There's always going to be something you never thought about. But at least going into this, um, you know, you know what might, might be a, a problem. I can't tell you how many weeks I spent trying to figure out the Subaru transmission and how I was going to do the motor mount. And I have since learned that uh, um, Seth Bourgeois at... Um, um, What's the name of this company? Rebirth. Rebirth has already, because I talked to, to, to Seb, he's decided to make these. So now if you want to do an 818, uh, you don't have to do any of this kind of stuff. Just, just order it from him, and his, I think his price is like $1,300, $1,400. Very, very reasonable. 
for the complexity of what this, this part is. So uh, sometimes you can get, it's better to be lucky than, uh, than anything else. So got lucky if you want to do that. Where are the batteries going to go? Uh, it may seem kind of obvious. I'll put some here, I'll put some there. Uh, actually, I found it is extremely helpful to go through a detailed plan of how you're going to mount the batteries, exactly how they're configured, where the wires are actually going to go. I go to the trouble of that actually putting where the straps are. Uh, I may be a little obsessive, but the reason why I find this helpful is because there's a lot of other stuff you've got to put in this car. And after you put the batteries in, you got to say, where's the fuse going to go? Where's the cutoff switch going to go? Where's the controller going to go? Where's the chill plate going to go? Um, and, and the more that you have figured out the big things, like the, uh, where the batteries are going to go, the easier it is to plan for the other stuff. If you kind of just like, well, I'll just put them here and put it there, I think you're going to find that, uh, well, you're going to be redoing it probably a few times. So I tend to do fairly detailed drawings. And I also, on this particular build, had another objective which was to make the car very lightweight, as lightweight as I could. And so I just decided to not have any battery boxes. I decided to do the whole thing pretty much with aluminum angle bars and um, uh, one eighth inch steel rods. Uh, I did get a little concerned when the guys from uh, New Zealand started talking about three and 20 G-forces and uh, what that was gonna do. So I, I have to go home and do a little bit of serious thinking, but, uh, um, or either pretend I didn't hear that, but uh, um, uh, in driving around the, the sonnet so far, I'm very, very pleased that there has been zero movement of any cell, which is, by the way, better than I can say for the battery boxes that I have in the Porsche. So I was looking for zero movement, very, very rigid, attached to the chassis, and of course, if you're going to do that, it's not a matter of just where the battery boxes go, but actually where you're going to attach them, what are the attachment points to the chassis and everything else. Instrumentation. Um, I, this is kind of my love-hate topic. Um, if there's one thing I want to say to the HPVS guys is do something about that little gauge. Please do something with that crappy little gauge. You know, it's just like it's the worst. But I, love, I love the system. I love everything about it, and I hate that gauge. I even like the programmer, but not the gauge. And, uh, and so I have to say that we're still in the very early days of EV instrumentation. Hopefully, in coming years, we'll make huge strides forward. Um, but um, what I decided to do in um, I was kind of half satisfied with, with how the Porsche turned out in terms of uh, the EV part of the, of the instrumentation. I did a little gauge pod to hold things. It's OK. It's not fabulous. It's not what I call OEM quality. My, my objective is that somebody looks at this car and says, oh, I didn't know they made this car, they being some big manufacturer, which means that they didn't think that I just cobbled it together in my garage. So I'm looking for a real finished look. And I decided to rip out every single instrument in the Saab and replace it with all new digital instrumentation. Um, so I have a GPS speedometer. I've got a digital everything. Um, by the way, if you want to do this, a great company to work to look for and uh, to work with is SpeedHut. SpeedHut will create all kinds of gauges for you very reasonably, and they will do custom um, gauge faces. So. Actually, on mine, you'll see. Hopefully, you'll see in another photo. It says Sonnet EV on the gauge face. You know, you can put anything you want there. Put your wife's name, and that way, you'll she won't be that upset about your budget. But uh, um, you know, so you can customize these things. And and what I have found very very helpful because it, I don't know any other way. Uh, I have to visualize what it's going to look like um, because then you're spending big dollars to buy the instrumentation. So what I do is I take a photograph of the original dash and simply superimpose what the new instrumentation is going to look like. You can test out fonts and colors. And the web is fantastic. Like, you can go to um, Speed Hut and get the actual image of the gauge and manipulate it any way you want. And then a little bit of your uh, image uh, you know, editing, and you can create a, a dashboard. So this was uh, one of my 
early versions of, uh, of what this dashboard was going to look like. It looks very much like that. Not exactly, because I, I changed a few things, but it gives you a pretty good idea of where you're going to go. And it's well worth the effort, I think. Uh, that's the GPS speedometer right there. And, and up there, where there was an air vent, I put the little uh, uh, antenna uh, for the GPS. And by the way, I'm a big fan of GPS speedometers now, super fan, because not only does it give you very accurate speed and, uh, and uh, all the other stuff that a, a speedometer is supposed to do, but uh, it's electronic in the sense that you press little buttons and it gives you automatic, uh, you don't want to test your you know, one-eighth mile, uh, you don't want to do a quarter mile, you want to do, you know, you, you know I, I don't know what you're like, but you know, I'm in the car, I've got a stopwatch, I'm trying to do this, I'm, trying, I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm not a professional like, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to do this in the car, and usually my wife doesn't want to go with me because she thinks it's boring to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> So she says, honey, you just take the car and you do that. So fortunately, with this little GPS speedometer, you just press a button, and when you're ready to go, you go. And when you finish, you just press a button, and there's your, there's your, your readout. That's really cool. Anyway, you could do that in a regular car. It doesn't have to be, a, doesn't have to be an EV. A, a couple things just to, to think about um, are the human factors with the dashboard. And um, you know, can you read this stuff, uh, especially that little gauge from uh, uh, you know, the Curtis gauge, uh, you know, you have to have a magnifying glass and I don't know what to see that thing, especially in sunlight. So I decided to take that, that gauge. This is an indented part of the dash. You can't really see it. And I said, well, I'm going to put it there. It's where a clock used to be. And at least in, in sunlight or most sunlight, there's a little bit of a shadow and you can actually see the gauge. Uh, this is the um, JDL 404. It's really bright. And you don't really, you know, that's easy to see from, from anywhere. Can you reach the stuff? Can you, uh, uh, you know, uh, can you do that? And then I also decided to do a, a push button start. I don't, I'm a form, you know, follows function uh, guy. So it always bothered me that an ignition key has all these positions and you can only, only one of them is good for an EV. You know, what do you do when you turn it to, you know, that you can't really do much with that ignition switch. So I just thought, well, this is, an EV really should just have a push button because you don't need a key. So anyway, I decided to do that too. The next problem you're going to have is where do those high current wires go? Um, and how do you really make them safe? Now, cars have got all kinds of wires. You're going to have a 12-volt you know, circuit. But you're going to have a lot of ugly, well, maybe you think they're beautiful, orange uh, you know, welding cables. And uh, where are you going to put them in the car? Because the chances are that you're going to have, uh, let's say, the motor and the controller in the front of the car. And you're probably going to have a battery pack in the, behind the seats, which means somehow you're going to have to run a cable from the front of the car to the back of the car. And in the Porsche, there was a great little tunnel that was in the, uh, the Beck Speedster. Very, very convenient, exactly the right size. And all the cables just went right through that, and it was not a problem. In the Sonnet, it's got a flat pan. Uh, there's really no convenient way to get, the, uh, to get the cable from the motor bay or engine bay down in, a, in the bottom of the car. Plus, I'm not so sure I'd like to have a welding cable at the bottom of my car uh, exposed. So you've got to figure out right away, as you, as you begin to plan, where those cables going to go. Uh, the solution here was um, in the uh, in the door, uh, uh, under, not in the, there's a, a little kind of gap where the carpet comes up. Uh, I had to drill through part of the chassis to get there with some uh, a strain relief, but it turns out it worked pretty well. The question is like, can you bend the cable enough to go and navigate to where you want to go? I don't know any other way to do this than actually have some welding cable and actually bend it and actually figure that out. Uh, if, so to really plan this one, you've got to buy some cable, unfortunately, or get some thick rope or something and try to figure out how it would actually fit. Wiring diagrams. Uh, how many of you are electrical engineers? Okay, so you can ignore this part. Uh, for, for those of you who are not electrical engineers and you, the whole thought of wiring makes you ill, um, uh, you can still overcome that and build an EV, uh, but I would strongly uh, urge everybody who is not yet engaged in this to actually draw a wiring diagram. 
before you wire. And by the way, after you are wiring it and you decide to change your wiring diagram, I strongly suggest you change the paper copy so you can remember what you've done. Ask me how I know this. <laughs> this is the, uh, the actual wiring diagram uh, for the 12 volt system in the, um, uh, in the sonnet. Um, I got a little uh, compulsive and decided to rip out every single wire in the, in the sonnet and do the entire thing over again, uh, because uh, primarily because it was a 1969 car. Many of the wires looked very frayed. A lot of the connectors were no good anymore. And I was convinced that the old relays, these old Bosch relays, were going to die on me any moment. So I decided to redo the whole thing, plus put LED lights in. And so with all that, you know, frankly, it wasn't worth saving a single wire. I ripped it out, which gave me the opportunity to completely rewire the car the way I thought it should have been wired back in 1969. Uh, so I put in a modern uh, fuse box, uh, Ron Francis wiring. For those of you who have not yet discovered Ron Francis, has a great little box, this little thing up here. Uh, you can get, by the way, all this stuff is from the, uh, the hot rod guys. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming at this as from more of a car guy than a, you know, a battery person or, you know, a, um, and, uh, but, you know, the, the, the hot rod guys have found a lot of this stuff already. And uh, Ron Francis has a, a, a great little product. I think it's called the Bear Panel or something like that. But it just, it's just perfect for an EV because it has just the right amount of uh, fuses you need and, uh, and, uh, and other terminals. It mounts very conveniently almost anywhere you want to put it. And it gives you the opportunity, if you want to, to completely rewire uh, the car. And by the way, I'm not talking about a modern, uh, you know, uh, 2013 uh, Infiniti or BMW. I'm really talking about cars that have power nothing. No power windows, no power seats, no radio, no heater, no air conditioning, uh, you know, no uh, the, the, you know, whatever it is, no uh, automatic pressure gauges. Um, I'm really talking about classic cars or in the case of the 818, it's another minimalist car uh, because I'm talking about uh, the particular platform I'm interested in, which is basically high performance, two-seater lightweight cars, and you don't have all that stuff. If you want to uh, instead convert something that's really complicated, you're, you're back to the CAN bus and a lot of other things, and this may or may not be relevant. But in any case, I think it's a great idea to draw out your, uh, your wiring diagrams in, in, in advance, if you're not an electrical engineer, find your cousin who is and have him look at it. And I also would strongly recommend three different wiring diagrams, the 12 volt, the high power circuit, whatever that is, and the five volt control circuit. Um, and um, instead of getting them all co-mingled, co I have found it as I'm actually building the car, it's very, very helpful to be able to, to, to refer to these different systems because they're really, uh, Although you have a ground, 12-volt uh, ground to the chassis, the other two systems are really self-enclosed. And uh, so you can, it's, it's pretty easy to, to, uh, to draw them out as self-enclosed systems. By the way, that was also that, that product I told you before. The conceptual drawing software did that wiring diagram. And I can't find a better product to do that. So after doing this planning, and, uh, and, and minimal expenditure. I mean, we're talking about your $100 into this project, maybe $150 if you went ahead and bought that really you know, expensive little digital measuring device. You know, otherwise, you're well, you know, $10 into this project. Um, at this point, you can actually do some serious procurement planning and figure out what's going to go into this car. Again, I'm a little obsessive, but I like to know every nut and bolt that's going to go into this thing um, because Actually, you can save a lot of money by buying certain things together instead of going down to the hardware store to buy each bolt and nut, uh, which will cost you about 10 times as much. So I like to really try to specify what's going into the car and then where am I going to get this part. This is actually the, uh, the procurement I've gone through with the 818. Now, the 818 uses WRX running gear, Subaru running gear, 
Subaru is this odd world that I don't know much about, except they don't have part numbers. I guess they don't believe in that or they want to keep it proprietary to the dealers. So you have to actually go through a fair um, a, a number of loops to figure out exactly what part you want um, and uh, exactly what part number that is. And I like to take photographs because uh, sometimes one part number mysteriously changes and morphs into another one, but it's the same part. Uh, if you get a donor car, which is what Factory 5 um, imagines that you're going to do, this is uh, not an issue because you're simply taking parts out of the car, uh, you know, in the Factory 5 documentation. It says, open up the door, take out the door latch, throw away the door. And they call it a door latch. Well, the door latch, what are we talking about here? Because it's a little different between the 2002 and the 2007. Is it a trivial difference? Does it really make a difference? And you don't want the 2008, and you don't want the one from the station wagon because that's different than the sedan, et cetera. You get the idea. So you got to figure out what parts you're really talking about. And here I'm just talking about non-EV parts. These are just parts that are going to go into the car to complete it. But obviously, there's the EV components, too. I find it very helpful to separate out the EV components from the other components. Why? because in 99.9% .9 of the cases, they're different vendors. I mean, maybe there's some exception somewhere, but this, you're going to buy most of the non, or all the non-EV parts from the regular aftermarket auto guys. And you're going to be buying the EV parts from people who don't know what a, EV, they don't even know, they've never heard of hot waters. They, they're, they're selling, you know, you go to, you know, DigiKey or something like that. These are not automotive people. So you really want to separate that out. Um, this leads you to the preliminary budget. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I used to be the, uh, uh, the, the head in Massachusetts of the, the finance area. I was the chief secretary, and the entire state budget re reported to me. So I do get a little obsessive about budgets. And uh, I do believe in, in, in realistic budgets. So you really should have two budgets, the, the real realistic budget and then the budget that you show your significant other. Uh, so my wife is actually not here, and I would appreciate it if nobody contact her as I show this, I show this budget. Um, I, I've met guys, uh, these are mostly you know, hot rodder guys, and you, you, know, you overhear a conversation, well, how much did that cost you? And the guy says, well, I never really added up the receipts. The translation of that is he never wanted to add up the receipts because he didn't want his wife to find out what the car actually cost. But this is uh, my first take based on a fairly detailed procurement uh, exercise and a fairly detailed planning exercise of what the 818 is going to come in at. Now, um, you know, the first question is, can you do it cheaper? Yeah, you can do it cheaper. Yeah. Can, uh, you know, what if you use a donor? Is it going to be better? Yeah, yeah, it's probably going to be less expensive. You know, um, but I'm trying to hit a certain quality level. I want this to be either all new parts or completely reconditioned parts. So I've got a certain hurdle. You may have a different hurdle, but I'm just saying that's where this budget is. I believe this is going to be accurate, you know, plus or minus uh, $500. Yeah. So the are mostly paint yeah, let me, let me talk about the paint job uh, in one second, because that's a, that, there's some things that are not in this budget. Uh, there's always footnotes to every budget, and I like lots of footnotes. Uh, the, the footnote here is, is uh, it doesn't include labor, whatever that is. Uh, most of the, uh, sometimes you have to hire somebody to do something, like a welder if you don't know how to weld or something like that. It, it, whoops. Uh, it doesn't include whatever garage space, taxes, you know, all the stamp taxes, miscellaneous things. It doesn't include all the gotchas you don't know about yet, like the unknowns. And in the particular case of this car, it does not include a paint job. Now, there's a reason why it's not in this budget for this particular car. For the Cobra, the Cobra came, and the way they make the fiberglass is it has you know, various kinds of, of, um, of uh, forms, and you get big seams that come down the form, and you've got to sand that off and you have to finish off the gel coat, for those of you who know about fiberglass. And you've got to also do a number of other things because, frankly, the original body that Factory 5 did was not period correct enough for me, so I finished off edges and so forth. And you actually had to paint the car because it looked like hell if you didn't. 
The 818, though, is the latest iteration of the technology of making fiberglass forms. Uh, I, I went to the Factory 5 open house, uh, you know, uh, back uh, about a month ago. I've actually seen and touched the car. They let me into the uh, design uh, R&D area, and I spent about three hours on the car with, uh, with two of their uh, senior engineers, and, I, and I, I got a pretty good handle about what this car looks like and what the finish is, and I can tell you that it's not a totally Concours AAA plus finish, but you know what? I would be happy driving this car around with no paint for a couple of years. Wouldn't bother me horribly. Now, I'm probably going to paint it, but I figured, you know, I'm going to finish the car, and I don't need to put $5,000 in or $7,000 in for a paint job. It's going to come in white. If you, if, you, if you can't stand white, then you better bump up your budget. But I believe, short of the paint job and short of the other footnotes here, that this is a pretty realistic $35,000 car for what I hope will be a mirror of a high-performance current standard car. Now when, I, now, when I say current standard, this is a kit car that's designed for both street and track, but is not the same as a high-end Mercedes with all the bells and whistles and creature comforts. Okay, so, I mean, it is what it is. It's kind of a, it's a reduced down uh, sports car, reduced down for creature comforts. No heated seats, you know, no nav system, you know, all that kind of stuff. Special issues. Um, as you're planning this, there are a couple things you need to be thoughtful about because it's really helpful to think of this in advance, then halfway through the build, when you said, oh my God, you know, if I had only known that, I wouldn't have put X, Y, Z here. And uh, there's not that many of them, but let me just touch on a few. One is the master cutoff switch, uh, you gotta have one. I actually have two cutoff switches. Um, I like to do a cutoff switch and then a little toggle switch uh, to cut off the 12 volt circuit for the DC to DC converter, very convenient very convenient when you have no ignition key and all you have is a push button because all I have to do when I leave the car is toggle off the DC, the DC con, uh, converter and I figure that most people, unless they're uh, guys who came to this convention and are electrical engineers, you're never gonna find that toggle switch, you won't know how to turn on the car. Uh, but you also need a master uh, control and uh, you gotta figure out where that's gonna go. The charge port, um, what kind of charge port are you gonna have? Um, and where is it going to go? Both for a convenience point of view, uh, for a safety point of view, and then a usage point of view. I'm uh, really, really old school, and I like to go low weight. So for me, it's the uh, uh, three-prong plug. I don't believe in fast charging. I figure I either want to charge the car in four minutes, or I'll just wait eight hours. I'm not going to wait around three hours charging the car, doing anything. I mean, that's, that's my use of the car. I'm either going to drive the range and charge it at home at night or, or someplace I'm going to stay, uh, or uh, you know, the fact that I can go to some level two whatever thing at some parking lot in some you know, part of the city and recharge the car is just, not, it's just unthinkable for me, for me. You may be different. You may want to have uh, some high-end uh, uh, charge or you might have something already set up, but you need to think about that. I like this OEM finish feel, which means emblems, labels. I like to have little labels that say high voltage, you know, because somebody might, um, some kid might open up the, the hood of the car and I like them to look down and note that it's 650 volts before they're electrocuted in some way. It would be nice to do that. So uh, some kind of labeling is, is uh, something that you should think about. And finally, you are putting oftentimes non-standard uh, uh, instrumentation into the dash. And, uh, uh, you know, for, for all the, the automotive guys who are, you know, you're getting like your, your dashes, uh, your instrumentation from Speed Hut, they already have great mounting systems because they know this is going to go into automotive dashes. Uh, the people who designed the JLD 404, I don't know who they are, but they probably never thought this was going to be in an automobile. They never thought it was going to be an automobile, which means it's not really designed for vibration. It's not really designed specifically for any kind of dash. 
In fact, it comes with a little tiny, you know, plastic surround, and I put it, uh, you know, um, uh, when I got the thing from Jack, I put it in the dash, and it kind of wobbled around, and I thought, you know, how the hell am I going to put this thing in the, you know, it had a little kind of clip, but I wasn't very confident that after about 100 miles, this thing wasn't going to be flopping around. And it's a fairly big piece of a, you know, a, a big thing, but it's about the size of your fist. So you got to think about uh, that as well. It turns out in the Saab, uh, there's a bulkhead in terms of the uh, master, uh, the cutoff switch. And that's where the, um, uh, uh, the gauge was for the, the, the fuel gauge, because you have to access that. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have the car kind of pre-designed for a good place to put the cutoff switch, that's great. Otherwise, you're going to have to find the place for it in the Porsche. Uh, I put mine behind the rear seat uh, in, the, in the passenger area. I can't remember where Jack put his, but you're going to put it different ways. You want to be able to reach it in an emergency from the driver's seat. Uh, you want it to be visible. I think you want it to be visible. You may not feel that way, but you've got to have the design considerations to figure that out. And the, and the Saab, you know, it went there. Uh, you get some drawings off the internet for what it looks like, figure out what the dimensions are. You can do all this pre-planning. And then uh, you actually put it in, and the finish of it, uh, I think it really came out uh, very well. But you've got to have the, the, uh, the thought to put into that. The charge port, um, you know, most of the time, this is going to go where the gas tank uh, was, except in the Porsche. Uh, Jack had this great idea about putting it where the torsion bar cover was. You can fit a three-pronged plug there. You can't fit anything else there, though. I'm a three-pronged plug guy. It's fine for me. But if you're going to put a different kind of uh, you know, heavy-duty connector uh, system, uh, you're not going to probably be able to put it there either. The original Speedster, by the way, had a crazy way of filling up the gas tank, I think. You had to raise the hood. The gas tank was, uh, was in the boot of the, you know, the, the front of the car, and you had to fill the, the tank while the hood was up. And in the middle of the rain or something, I don't know what it, that would be like, and thinking about recharging it that way with an electric uh, plug did not make me uh, uh, you know, feel very good. So fortunately, there was the torsion bar. In terms of the sonnet, uh, I decided, yep, I'm going to put this where the, um, uh, the gas uh, fill was. Probably you're going to have to take the entire thing apart before you can figure out how you're actually going to wire it and how you're going to finish it off. Because you're, it's going to be very unlikely that you'll find good enough engineering drawings of this part of the car because uh, you know most of the time this is not a big repair item. So I had to take it all apart and figure out what I was going to do. Uh, hopefully you can find something that's a standard uh, yes, uh, that would be a standard fit, but you may have to design something yourself uh, to make it work. Emblems. In uh, this day of uh, digital technology and the internet, uh, this, is, this is much easier to solve than it was uh, a number of years ago. Uh, for the Sonnet, for example, I took the front hood emblem, uh, I simply copied it on my scanner, my, you know, my digital scanner. I traced the outline just using, you know, a regular, you know, uh, computer type uh, digital technology. I came up with some new type. I found a guy on the internet who would make me one of these things, exactly the same dimension, same, you know, reverse print and everything else, $35 delivery in four days on the internet. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. Just amazing. I'm just totally astounded. There's now all these 3D printers and all these places. You can dream up all kinds of stuff, and you can have it, you know, you can get the imaging for free, and you get the thing printed up. Um, I just found out about this thing called iMaterialize. Did most of you know about that? I mean, I, I, I found out about this about, you know, three or four weeks ago. You, they have a whole uh, way that you go in there, and you can design something in 3D. You press a button, and it will give you like 15 different materials that will be printed out in. Everything from platinum, believe it or not, through, you know, through rubber. And you, you want ABS plastic, you want this, you want that. You want different colors, you want different sizes. You press it, you get an instant quote, and then they deliver it to you in four days. So, you know, it's possible for really a modest amount of money. And by modest, I mean, you know, under $100 
to completely do a complete labeling program for your vehicle. So, but you have to think about where those labels are going to go and, and what you're uh, what you're going to do. And my favorite are the dash mounts. Um, uh, again, technology can come to the rescue. You can actually um, modify or or let me say enhance the, uh, the this, this instrumentation. By the way, I love this JDL 404. If you know, we need to make more progress like this in some other area. This is a fabulous piece of equipment, uh, easy to install in terms of the wiring, uh, a real pain to get it into the dash, in my opinion. Uh, but what I did was, uh, I again used a conceptual drawing over on the left to think of some kind of you know thing that coming from the back that was going to clamp it up against the uh, fiberglass dash like the other instrumentation that uh, car guys are, are used to. But in this case, it's a rectangle, not a circle. And I had a friend who uh, has a 3D printer. And my advice is to make a friend with somebody who has a 3D printer. Uh, you know, you know, these days, it's probably your neighbor or somebody. Everybody's got one of these things. Or, or, or if you really want, go buy a 3D printer. You can get one for 1000 bucks or something. And. Uh, yeah, right there. That's a key, key insight, you know. Uh, and he printed this thing off uh, overnight, and we tested it out. We actually did a couple of versions. Uh, I made a little frame in the front, painted it with enamel paint, and, uh, and that's the finished installation. It's great. doesn't rattle. Fantastic. And uh, so you can, you can do stuff like that. Um, my, my final pet peeve are the, are the fuse mounts. Um, I had a rather unfortunate near disaster. Uh, I, I made a, a, a bad assembly mistake. I put a washer between the um, battery, between the fuse and the uh, and the um, uh, and the cable. I don't know why I did this. Uh, I should have put. A, I have a Nord lock on the front, on the top, the bolt, the Nord lock, and then I put a washer in between. I don't know what I was thinking that day. I went out in the Sonnet, decided to do some speed trials, running 650 amps. I began to smell something that was like cheap Japanese electronic equipment. And uh, I said, well, this, everything must be getting seeded in. I, you know, I, I was in denial. Went a few more times, and the smell really started getting pretty bad. I, it smelled like it was coming from the rear of the car. I opened up the, the hood, the, the rear uh, component, the rear uh, compartment of the car, and my fuse holder had melted down to within a fraction of an inch of the metal chassis. Because it's made out of cheap plastic, it, it apparently does not have a very high heat resistance. And, um, uh, and actually, if I had kept on driving, I would have had one hell of a ground leak because 650 amps or something like that would have been going through the entire chassis. Now, I told you I like fiberglass cars. I like, well, fiberglass doesn't conduct electricity very well. And so a lot of the car wouldn't have been electrified. And I do have you know, insulation in the, um, in the um, cockpit. But that wouldn't have been a happy day. So I decided to go back. And I didn't like the, uh, the, the uh, fuse mount anyway. But you know you can make your own stuff. This is this is basically made out of um, Delrin and uh, nylon, and there's a few components like this that there you can't buy these anywhere. You have to make them. But if you plan for it in advance, or unfortunately if you have a bad incident, plan for it afterwards, uh, you can actually improve what the uh, manufacturers have out there. Yes. How high? Do you know? Oh, good tip. Okay. Uh, maybe I better, I better look at that more carefully. I, I actually pick, I picked them because of their heat uh, uh, characteristics. But I, yeah, okay. All right. I'll uh, have to take a careful look at that. That's it. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I don't know whether we have any time for questions, but um, I, you know, uh, happy to be here.